Okay. Hello. Hi, everybody. Happy Thursday evening. Uh, what is today? It is the is September 12th. Is that it? Yes. Uh, today is September 12th. Good evening. Um, I am Joshua Gonzalez. I am going to be your presenter today. Uh, <laughs> so let's get started. We're going to do a Housing 101 today. You probably know that. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't be here probably. But uh, that's what we're doing. We're aiming to uh, just kind of crash course you folks into some housing advocacy. Just uh, like to make sure that all of our residents and everyone in Los Angeles is well informed. Um, so this is what we're going to do tonight. Okay. So I am going to get started here and share my screen. Bear with me while I set up all that kind of stuff. Okay. That's good. Now, I'm, when I share, people are like, we can see your entire browser. I'm like, I know. I do know this. Um, <laughs> I do it on purpose because it helps me to set it up in the way that works for me. So no one be alarmed. Uh, it will be okay. Let me share. I don't know if there's any sound. I don't think I have sound in this. Yeah. Okay. All right. And now you should see the presentation screen. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So, Housing 101 Intro to Housing Advocacy. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Again, uh, my name is Joshua Gonzalez. Uh, I am the Education and Events Director at Abundant Housing LA. I have been in this position for, ooh, uh, coming up on two and a half years, I believe. Um, not in this position. I've been with Abundant Housing LA for coming up on two and a half years. Um, this position and just under that. So I started as a field organizer at uh, Abundant Housing LA, which I believe one of our field organizers is in the audience today with us. So Courtney, uh, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, I do believe that, I don't know how this is working, but I know that there was going to be like a housing 101 watch party um, <laughs> th at, well, through one of our chapters. Um, and so that's really exciting. I, I hope that all you folks are enjoying that if you're tuned in. Um, okay. So uh, let me just go back to this. So yes, uh, I'm Joshua Gonzalez. Um, I like to speak, uh, as you may notice. Um, yes, and so we are Abundant Housing LA, uh, often known as AHLA, or some people just say Abundant Housing, whatever. Um, but uh, Abundant Housing uh, has a mission. And so we envision Los Angeles County as a place where every resident can find an affordable home that meets their need in their neighborhood in their neighborhood of choice. So we aspire to create sustainable and diverse communities that prioritize accessibility, minimize car dependency, and foster a healthier and more inclusive environment for everybody. Um, we want more different types of housing at all levels of affordability, right? We're not just like only affordable housing, though a lot of that is very good and needed. Uh, but our our sort of principal belief is that there is a housing shortage and crisis, and that that is what is driving up the rents and making it difficult for people to maintain secure housing. So we believe that if we build more housing of all kinds of typologies, of at all levels of affordability, that that will in turn bring down the rents. It will make sure that people are safe. And, uh, and comfy in their affordable homes. Um, and people won't be breaking their bank on just trying to have a roof over their head, right? That's the idea. Um, now we are talking about housing. We're talking about Los Angeles. We're in the US, right? So I think it's really, ah, excuse me, I went a little bit too far. I think it's a little really important, uh, really important to do a land acknowledgement. So Abundant Housing LA recognizes and acknowledges the first people of this ancestral and unceded territory. It belonged to the Tongva Gabrielino people, and the land and the land is now occupied by our various layers of government. 
um, Senate districts, supervisorial districts, so on and so forth. Um, where I live in the Pico Union neighborhood, which is close to downtown, um, I am in State Senate District 26 and City Council District 1. Uh, we acknowledge and honor Indigenous folks' elders, past and present, and their and their descendants. We recognize uh, that the Tongva peoples are still here, and we are committed to lifting up their stories, culture, and community. Something that I found particularly interesting when doing a little bit of my own reading uh, on, on these first peoples was that they were a nation that ensured every member of the community had a home. And so I think that we share a fundamental human responsibility to ensure that it's the people who came after that we can say the same, that we are providing everyone with a home. So thank you for that. Uh, what are our goals today? Well, as our goals are to address, uh, or, or as, a, as a mission uh, of the organization, we want to address the upstream causes of the housing crisis and housing shortage. Um, and so some of that means that uh, we need the, the community's help. We need your folks' help, right? And not just because, um, you know, more people is good and it's, you know, a force for power and things like that, but also because we want to make sure that the community is advocating for something that benefits them, right? That we want to make sure that needs are being met where maybe they aren't now, right? So um, our goals today are to understand a couple of things. The importance of housing advocacy, which we'll get into. Um, uh, how uh, the history of housing policy led to this housing shortage. That's that's one of the, the key points of today. And then we can go further into other things about housing and other presentations and things like that. But these are the key points here. We want you to understand why it's important for you to be involved in housing advocacy. And for you to do that, it's important to understand how the history of housing policy mostly particularly in Los Angeles, but far and wide, um, has led to this housing shortage, right? Okay, so let's start uh, with a little bit about the importance of housing ad advocacy. So uh, why is housing important? Why, why is housing advocacy important? Well, housing is a fundamental need, right? It's a basic necessity. Housing is essential uh, for physical safety, security, and health. It provides shelter from the elements a stable environment for daily life. Often something that I think that some folks, including myself, take it, take for granted, right? Um, there's a lot of things that maybe I get to do throughout the day because I have like a safe home and, um, and maybe someone who is unhoused doesn't have that same luxury. And it's not something I think about often, but it, it is a foundation for well-being, right? Stable housing is a cornerstone for personal well-being and quality of life. It affects everything from mental health to job stability. And honestly, while maybe not uh, officially, lawfully, legally, um, it is a human right, right? Like the United Nations uh, says that like adequate housing is a fundamental uh, human right and it's uh, critical for the enjoyment of all other rights, right? And so that's something that, that's that's really important there. What's the impact there of housing, though, right? Like, like what, are, what does it mean? Like, okay, all of that stuff sounds great. Yes, basic necessity. Yeah, of course, foundation for well-being. Yeah. Well, what, what does that mean, though? Um, well, it actually, just like we mentioned, enjoyment of all other rights um, affects everything from mental health to job stability. There are literal health outcomes, mental health, healthcare access. All of these things are affected by housing, where it is, what kind those sorts of things. Um, it, it offers stability, performance, concentration, focus, all kinds of stuff. These things um, ha can only exist around housing, but the thing is, is that not all housing is around those things, right? So there's an impact there, right? Like if you have access to all of these things, like nearby employment or grocery stores, like that's the in an impact of your housing right? If you don't have access to those, same thing. So we see that um, there's there's a lot of different reasons for uh, housing advocacy to be important because housing is literally something that dictates how we are performing in the rest of our life. It's like the ultimate performance review, 
right? Like it's like if you don't have a stable home, um, you can't do a lot of these other things that that people do, right? There's not economic stability, like employment opportunities uh, can be affected by that, right? Like you don't have an address, you know, that sort of thing. Um, all of these things are, are huge. And that's why uh, housing advocacy is such a big deal because it really affects everything that we do. So what is that role, right? Well, there's policy influence, okay? So uh, there's advocacy efforts. Uh, that can lead to the creation and implementation of laws and policies that promote affordable housing, protect tenant rights, and ensure equitable development. But I think what's more important there, and, and to be clear and to the point, is that that policy influence is what allows people to have that stable housing environment, which allows them to, like we said, perform better in the rest of their life. Right. And so we should care about that policy influence because that's really what's dictating stuff. It helps us to address affordability. Um, if things are way too expensive, we got to tell it, hey, what, what's going on here? Or if it's too expensive and not of high quality, there's a problem there. And so in advocacy, you might go ahead to do something that addresses those things. There, There's already advocacy around like making sure that there are rental assistance and tax credits and incentives and things like that to make sure that people have housing. It helps to combat homelessness, right? Advocacy can ensure that comprehensive supportive services such as mental health care, addiction treatment, and job training are available to those that are experiencing homelessness if they get there, right? Um, promoting policies that prioritize providing for uh, permanent housing to homeless individuals uh, is obviously the the first step in stabilizing their lives. At least that's the housing first approach, right? And so again, that is linked to what we were saying previously about how whether or not you have like a home and, and, and you know, safe place to, to be, like those sorts of other things will fall into disarray or can anyway. Um, and it also, uh, Earlier, I said, like, it's important for you folks to be part of this because um, it, it allows it is you live here, right? Like, this is part of you. You are not just like in a vacuum as a resident of Los Angeles or any place anywhere. You are, you know, a part of that place that you're at. Right. And so there the role of advocacy is to engage with the community and it, it, it brings together the different uh, stakeholders, the different decision makers, and that can be you, right? That sounds like maybe, oh, well, it's, you know, it's that rich person over there. And we have a history of that sort of thing, right? With like wealthy people sort of like being the loudest and most effective voices in the room. And that's not always a good thing. Often not a good thing, especially in terms of the uh, concept of housing, right? Um, and so that's that's a really important thing to think about with the role of advocacy is that you yourself watching this now, whether you're here tonight watching this or you're watching this in the future, um, you have a part in these four points. Policy influence, addressing affordability, combating homelessness, community engagement. You yourself have a role there. There are literal, uh, a lot of community processes baked in to a lot of these housing things. And if you don't know about them, which often I think is what maybe some of the... Uh, I'm trying to be kind. Um, <laughs> maybe some of the folks that are uh, not so much into helping others, um, you know, like we need to be there to sort of like balance those scales or at least show them that they are outweighed by folks that just want good for others, right? Like that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, let's get into some key terms. Now, this is going to be word salad. Now, I love a good salad. Um, I like a lot of ingredients. And so <laughs> this is this is coming at you. You sometimes can get so many ingredients that you don't know what it is. And you're like, I don't know. I thought I tasted arugula, but I don't know. There was also pepper. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is going to sound like word salad at first, but it's sort of just to prime you a little bit for some of the stuff that we'll discuss after, right? So here are some key terms. Take notes if you like. Um, that's pretty cool if you're there, like taking notes and writing and stuff. I love that. Um, uh, but, and if that helps you, especially, please do that. But we do also have a, uh, a glossary that will have all of these terms and more. 
uh, that I'll be sending as a follow-up to everybody. So don't feel like, oh, I missed, I didn't write down that definition. I missed this. I don't remember what that is. We got you. We got you. Okay. So uh, first, affordable housing, right? Housing that is reasonably priced, allowing individuals and families to afford other necessities such as food, healthcare, transportation. Now, there is a, a little bit of a, a quirk with this one because there is a difference between like capital A affordable, which is usually like subsidized type stuff. Uh, but then there's like lowercase affordable, which is maybe like naturally occurring. So it's not like necessarily that um, these are deed restricted units or something, but it's like sort of it is priced more affordable um, because of where it's located, the developments in that area, things like that, right? So that one's a little little tricky, but that is also in the glossary. So again, don't feel lost. Um, zoning laws, uh, regulations governing how land in a particular area can be used. These laws determine whether areas can be used for residential, commercial, industrial, or other purposes. Redlining a discriminatory practice in which services like home loans are withheld from potential customers who reside in neighborhoods classified as high risk, often based on racial or ethnic composition. Infill development, development of vacant or underused parcels within existing urban areas that are already largely developed, right? So if you think of uh, like that one abandoned building, like on a main street or something, infill development would support turning that abandoned building into something that the community needs, housing or something else. Transit-oriented development, a type of urban development that maximizes the amount of residential, business, and leisure space within walking distance of public transport. Um, you may or may not be familiar with Del Mar Station in, in Pasadena. Great, great, great example of transit-oriented development. Uh, suburban sprawl, the spread of suburbs away from the core city characterized by low-density residential housing, single-use zoning, and increased reliance on cars. Exclusionary zoning, zoning laws that effectively exclude certain types of housing, and by extension, certain groups of people, often based on income, race, or other demographics. CEQA, that's C-E-Q-A, also the California Environmental Quality Act, a statute that requires state and local agencies to identify the significant environmental impacts of their actions and to avoid or mitigate those impacts if feasible. Ooh, what a mouthful, yeah? Okay. <laughs> um, and was that, was that the one? Ah, mixed income housing. Okay, I wanted to make sure because I did remove some. Um, <laughs> housing developments uh, that include units affordable to people with a wide range of incomes. Uh, that's, that's a big one I think we'll actually get into later. Um, and then we have just have one more slide of these, so hang in there with me. Um, <laughs> YIMBY, that is an acronym for yes in my backyard, um, which is often used to describe someone who was like, yes, please build more housing, be it over there in a high opportunity or resource area or next to me, you know, that that's sort of what a YIMBY uh, could be described as. Uh, we have gentrification, the process by which uh, higher income households move into low income neighborhoods, often leading to displacement of existing residents and changes in the character and culture of the neighborhood. Housing preservation, efforts to maintain and improve uh, existing housing stock to ensure it remains affordable and in good condition. Density, the number of housing units per acre um, of land. Higher density means more units in a given area, which can support public transit and local businesses. Equitable housing, housing policies and practices that ensure all people have access to safe, affordable housing, regardless of race, income, gender, or other characteristics. Inclusionary housing, zoning regulations that require a certain percentage of new construction 
to be affordable for people with low to moderate incomes. Displacement, the process by which residents are forced to leave their homes due to factors such as rising rents, redevelopment, or here comes this term back around, gentrification. And then there's NIMBY, uh, the sort of the uh, <laughs> the anti the anti, anti antithetical sort of concept to YIMBY um, <laughs> is is NIMBY, which is not in my backyard. Um, typically describing residents uh, that oppose uh, proposed developments in their local areas, often with the implication that while they may agree with the principle of development, they oppose it being near them. Right. Um, okay. So let's jump in. Thank you for sticking with me through all those terms. I swear it'll pay off. Um, <laughs> it was a lot. And again, you'll be able to 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 review those uh, at a later date. We'll give you the glossary. All right. So history of housing in the U.S. I'm going to take a sip of water. Okay. So we're going to go way back just for a little bit, just to sort of remember our roots of Los Angeles, right? <laughs> so um, 16, 1700s, early American housing was influenced uh, by, uh, by uh, European styles with simple and, and functional homes built in really small villages or dispersed farmsteads, right? So urban areas like Boston and Philadelphia, began developing more compact housing uh, with grid patterns that laid the foundation of American urban planning. Um, but but earlier in like these 16, 1700s, there was a lot of farmland. This is this is Los Angeles, this picture um, in that from that time. It may be like a painting or a drawing or reimagining, not really sure. Um, but that's sort of what Los Angeles looked like. It was just big farms. It was farmland, farm space. It was all like that. Um, there was some uh, early urbanization in the 1800s. Excuse me, the Industrial Revolution uh, spurred rapid urbanization, leading to the growth of cities and and and, uh, and the need for affordable, dense housing. So uh, tenement housing became common for the working class, often overcrowded and poorly built, um, highlighting the need for formal urban planning and zoning by the late 19th century. Um, and then this final picture here is sort of like an AI enhanced and colorized uh, picture of of, uh, of a part of Los Angeles in the late 1800s, um, which is when they started recognizing the issues of unregulated growth, leading to um, uh, early developmental zoning laws, de development of zoning laws, um, and formal urban planning practices to address housing and public health concerns, right? So we sort of see um, that it was like very farmland, it was very undeveloped in certain ways. Um, and then it sort of like slowly as people moved in and time went on and all kinds of other things that happened in history, which I was never a fan of history in high school and in school. So this is all like new for me. I was like, what? I, I don't know. Anyway. Um, okay. So, um, so that's a little bit about the development. Now let's talk about policy. Sort of the development of policies over time. Um, the uh, these are these are just important ones, right, to get you started, so you can hit the ground running. Going, yeah, I'm a housing advocate. Um, so, uh, National Housing Act of 1934. So this established the Federal Housing Administration, or you may see that as FHA, and uh, it made home ownership more accessible through insured mortgages. The stock market crash of 1929 wiped out the assets of professional investors and regular citizens alike. Thousands of U.S. banks failed, as did um, numerous businesses. Unemployment skyrocketed, um, as did foreclosures of homes. So by 1933, nearly 50% of all mortgages were delinquent or in default. So uh, one of these sectors hit the hardest during the Great Depression was the construction industry. To revive it, along with the mortgage lending business, the FHA, or Federal Housing Administration, provided federal guarantees for loans made by uh, building and loan associations, banks, and other financial institutions. And so the idea was that the government backing would reassure the institutions and encourage them to lend on more generous terms. 
Um, that would in turn encourage individuals to buy homes, uh, which would in turn stimulate developers to build them, right? Um, so that that's a big thing there because that that's really important for how the development of sort of like housing and, and where it's built and things like that. Um, another big one um, was the GI Bill. It's the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944. Um, that provided returning veterans with housing benefits um, contributing to suburban boom. So especially in like uh, like World War II, um, especially in Southern California, there were a lot of folks that, that flocked here because we, there were factories, like war developments and stuff like that. Um, and also people were just kind of like understanding, like especially near the ocean in Long Beach and stuff, folks were like trying to uh, spread out there and then find a home there. And there was a lot of opportunity for work at the time in the area. Um, and then we have the Housing Act of 1949. Uh, this aimed to provide a decent home and a suitable living environment for every American family. At least that's what they quote, you know, sort of were saying, right? Um, it funded urban renewal, urban renewal projects um, that often led to displacement and demolition of low-income neighborhoods, though, right? So that's why it's sort of like a decent home and a suitable living environment for every American family. Sounds like a really good thing, but how that's done is what was harmful, right? So these are three sort of important policies, right? And then we have just a couple more here. There's the Fair Housing Act of 1968. So this uh, prohibited discrimination in housing based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, any of those protected characteristics that we know today. Um, it was part of the Civil Rights Act. It was actually Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act, um, but this particular sort of like entry in it uh, was opposed a lot. Um, and I believe it was uh, filibustered, maybe one of the most filibustered uh, things to to ever be filibustered. It was filibustered out the wazoo, um, and then uh, unfortunately, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And I think about a week later is when they finally decided, okay, fine, we'll let it get through. Um, bitter, 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 sweet uh, uh, situation there. But that is an important thing because um, that gives a lot of basis for. A lot of the work that we do and that hopefully you'll do as a housing advocate. Um, and then also a uh, Section 8 housing program that was passed in 1974 uh, provided rental assistance to low income families, enabling them to afford housing in the private market. That's a really, really important one as well. Um, something that's important for the communities uh, in Los Angeles, particularly the low income communities. Uh, and that's a really helpful thing for, for providing stable housing. And then finally is the low income housing uh, tax credit, or you might hear it referred to as LIHTC, um, L-I-H-T-C. That was passed in 1986, um, and it provides tax credits to private investors to support the development of affordable multifamily housing, right? So this is uh, really important um, because there are a lot of projects, there are a lot of uh, multifamily housing that are really only able to be made thanks to these tax credits, right? So this is this plays a huge part in uh, making sure that there's enough housing as well. So let's, those are sort of policies. We did talk a little bit about like whether they were hurt, you know, helpful or harmful, but let's get into some basic inequalities that sort of stem from these, these general sort of areas of policies, right? So we talked about how uh, there was, uh, the FHA was created to give out loans right, and mortgages because, you know, like the stock market crashed and uh, everything was terrible and everybody had no money and no food. It was bad, bad time, right? Um, and so, so what happened was, though, is that when the banks and lending companies decided that they were going to, uh, that they were going to give out loans and, and mortgages, mortgages and provide insurance, for homes, they had a little bit of like a yes or no, right? Like a dis discretionary, if you will, um, a discretionary process that said like, hey, uh, sure, there is low risk or high risk in that particular neighborhood, right? And so um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation or HOLC, H-O-L-C, 
uh, created maps that rated neighborhoods based on perceived mortgage security, leading to redlining. Um, and so communities of color were often rated as hazardous and denied loans, exacerbating racial segregation and disinvestment. There is some information that uh, alleges that the, you know, like redlining is maybe overhyped in the history of, of like housing and things like that. But the point remains that many folks in those areas, whether it was because of these redlining maps or not, uh, were denied the ability to buy their homes, right? In areas that that other people, discriminatory people did not want them, right? That this, the point remains. So, but the idea though, is that they could, you could see how, if you know what Los Angeles looks like from the sort of view on a map now, you can sort of see how like, okay, like there's certain areas that are more red and yellow lined than the others. And those sort of represent these areas that were um, diverse, had a lot of, you know, non-white folks um, as, as, as well as non-wealthy folks. And often those were the folks that would get turned down for loans, mortgage insurance, so on and so forth. And so take what you will from that. But I think history showed us that that was a harmful policy. It was inequitable. Another one that is, I don't know if it's more to the point or I don't, I don't know if it's more or less to the point. I think it's just that it's just as bad and reinforces <laughs> the harmful parts of redlining, which were racial covenants. These are restrictive deeds. These are legal clauses in property deeds that prohibited the sale of property to non-white individuals. Um, and so this enforced racial segregation in many neighborhoods. So as folks in those red or red and yellow line neighborhoods, like uh, maybe they wanted to go buy a house in one of these areas that was blue or green lined, so to speak. Uh, but those areas often had homes that had these kind of restrictive racial covenants. So they couldn't buy that even if they had the money, right? So even like rich non-white people um, had a lot of trouble living in these other areas because they either wouldn't be allowed to move in or if they did, they were attacked or in some cases they were sued, right? Like, oh, you're not allowed to live here. This is a neighborhood that's only for white wealthy people, like that sort of thing, okay? And so definitely huge inequity, right? Um, and then we sort of hit on this a little bit uh, 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 in a couple of the, the last slides, um, but uh, urban renewal, right? This this is a thing that sounds good on the surface, uh, but what this was is there was like mid 20th century uh, projects that aimed to redevelop blighted areas, and that often led to the displacement of low income and more and minority communities. Now. The, the issue there is that it was like left up to local control to decide like what area was considered blighted. Oh, that, that place is pretty blighted. It looks like trash. We should definitely redevelop it. And they're like, yeah, of course, just, just evict all of these people and displace them. We'll make it better, right? Terrible, 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 terrible policy. Great idea, you know, to like maintain like the sort of health and whatnot of a city bad when it displaces folks, particularly people that have already been dealt uh, a, a crappy hand uh, because of other policies and things like that. So not great. And with that, something else that sort of it reinforced the segregation, uh, the creation of segregation in Los Angeles is public housing. Um, uh, this is actually a picture of Ramona Gardens. Nothing wrong with Ramona Gardens. I want to be clear. Public housing is great. We should have more of it. Um, it's definitely part of those like different typologies or different types of housing that would help us to meet our city's needs. Um, but uh, what you'll see usually is that most, I would, this is not an official number, so don't quote me, but I would say that somewhere between like 90, 95% of public housing are in areas that also happen to be red and yellow lined, right? When looking at one of those red lining maps. And so that is because there is actually a policy in the California constitution 
it's called Article 34, and it, it is something that makes it so that way uh, no public housing can be built without the say-so of like the neighborhood stakeholders. And so when public housing was being built, it was placed in areas away from the white wealthy people, right? So again, that sort of idea of like NIMBY, like, yeah, we know people need public housing, so we should definitely build it. Um, but how about you build that over there somewhere, like away from me, right? So modern housing policy, we're getting through it, y'all, we're getting through it. So in this section, we'll be talking about the sort of effects of all of that information that we've gone over until now, right? Um, and sort of like what comes of it, um, things like that. So first, oh, I didn't, I didn't do a good job of animating that one, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> so some federal policy. These are contemporary policies. Um, Section 8 housing choice vouchers. We, we mentioned those before, right? Um, rental assistance to low-income families. That's important, right? And, and again, the same thing with the LIHTC. These things are important because they're helping us to fight these sort of negative policies um, that not only segregated LA, but also very much held up the amount of housing production, particularly starting at about the 1970s. Um, some state and uh, local housing policies uh, in include uh, SB9 and SB10. These are recent uh, legislation bills aimed at increasing housing supply by allowing more multifamily housing. Um, I can't remember which is which, actually, which is really terrible for me, but I'm really bad with, like, things that are close to each other. I'm a neural spicy kind of person. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, but uh, one of them actually allows, like, a single parcel, right, where, like, a single family home would be, um, a single parcel to be, like, divided, so that way, like, another house or another family unit or what's up, whatever could be built there. Um, so things like that are great, right? Because it, it, it allows us to do more infill development, which we mentioned in the key term section, um, again, which is making use of like vacant or underused areas of the land. Um, uh, another thing that's really important is the regional housing needs allocation. Um, you see RHNA, we call that RENA, right? Um, and so that is a mandate for local governments to plan for housing based on projected needs. So local governments need to look at their, their, their area that they oversee. They need to do a sites inventory. What kind of housing do we have? What is our population and demographics like? Um, what is our income level look like in the areas that I oversee? Um, and what kind of housing and what does it need to cost to make sure that all these people and the people that might be moving into this area in the next several years have a place to live? Right. How do I do that? And so the regional housing needs allocation is a sort of like state based thing that kind of zooms in a little bit to a local area and tells you, OK, this is your share of the housing you need to build over the next several years. You share that responsibility with other local and regional governments. Um, but uh, but that allocation is what, like, for example, the city of Los Angeles has to build so many things to meet their need. The RENA does not build the housing. It simply tells you, hey, this is what we need based on what is currently there and what we think and how we think your area might grow in the next several years. Um, and then there's zoning laws. Uh, so these have an impact on housing density and land use because they determine where you can build what between like commercial, industrial, residential, right? And so these are really, really important and we'll be getting into these. So the key issues and challenges that we're seeing with all of that information seems kind of random, kind of throwing that at you, but we're sort of giving you these highlights of like these really important, like sort of like talking points, if you will, in housing. And this is how they have sort of come together uh, all as one <laughs> to create this housing crisis for us, right? So there is a housing affordability crisis. One thing I forgot to mention, and I'll have to make sure I include this next time, is that um, some of those like uh, zoning 
that land use regulations actually severely cut down on the density that we could actually build. So if you're in LA, if you've kind of been all over LA, you might remember, or you might see still uh, these like sort of single story strip malls where there's like maybe a laundromat and there is like maybe a little like, you know, Thai food place or, or, or something like that, right? Like those strip malls. Well, ideally it would actually be great to be able to keep that ground floor retail and then build uh, housing units on top of that. But there were literal propositions that were uh, implemented that prevented that sort of thing, right? So um, this meant that like with all of these sort of limitations that are introduced in policy over, I don't know, the past like, it's been getting better now, but it, over the past, like, maybe, like, 100 years, um, it, it really cut down on the uh, the way that we use the space in Los Angeles, right? Like, we don't use it to its fullest because of the policies that are enacted. And so that means that production slowed down, so we're not building as much housing as we need uh, in general. And... It means that because of those limitations around like density, like you can't build as high, you can't use as much of the parcel land and things like that. It means that we build out, right? We build out instead of building up. And so then we're in like fire danger areas and all that good stuff, right? I say that sarcastically. Um, <laughs> but that also creates a little bit of competition in cost. Right. I love doing this. I don't know where this came from. It just came up for me one time. But I think about like, oh, of those people that are like rare toy collectors. Right. And it's like, oh, I had this cool like Burger King, like, I don't know, kids toy from like 1983 or something like that. And there's like only two of them that still exist. And one of them is on eBay and it's like fifty thousand dollars or something like that. Right. Um, and, and because there is a low supply for the large demand right so then it's like well someone can put that little toy up there even though it's janky it's kind of small maybe it costs like 50 cents to make at the time or something like that but because someone has deemed it has value um someone can charge some exorbitant cost right the same thing sort of applies to housing there's we have this shortage so that allows for the housing cost to go up it becomes a little competitive and you'll see that we have this severe cost burden in los angeles and california and beyond right that we are paying way more of our paycheck than we should be for rent and that's something that you see here in these slides um there is a homelessness issue right that leads to that so when when that severe cost burden hit us, some people, particularly low income folks, or even folks, and I should say, and folks that experience like a, a significant like financial emergency, um, are uh, that's how they can become homeless, right? That's how they can lose their home. It's not always just like, oh yeah, well, she did drugs. He did drugs. He's crazy. He, which is not an okay word to use these days, by the way, but for, you know, the vibe sake for, for what I'm trying to get across, uh, you know, like, oh, they're crazy. They have mental problems, blah, blah, blah. That's what made them homeless. Sure, that can happen, uh, but often it's not, that's not the cause, right? Or at least not on its own, right? <laughs> if anything, like, but, but that's something that often comes with being unhoused. Again, going back to the point at the beginning where we said that housing is a fundamental human need it makes you perform well in all the other areas, right? So uh, with that cost burden, anyone who has a significant financial emergency, um, who is already low income and subject to sort of like rising costs and things like that, um, can fall into homelessness. And you'll see this here, that even though in some ways we are improving and, and, and building more housing and things like that, um, since, uh, when was it? Since 2020, is that what it was? Yes, 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 I believe it was. Okay, so, um, homelessness has gone up slightly, um, down in some areas, which is fantastic, uh, but it has gone up overall. 
right? And so you see that happening. That is an issue we have. That is a challenge we're trying to overcome. And again, part of that is uh, gentrification. Uh, gentrification and displacement. And that comes from sometimes losing affordability of housing, right? So um, Los Angeles County has lost uh, like somewhere like 7,500 affordable rental homes between 1997 and 2022, um, with uh, many of these homes, excuse me, converting to market rate due to owner decisions to opt out of affordability agreements or or they sell the properties or so on and so forth, right? There's so many reasons that they, there are a few reasons that, um, uh, that a home, a unit could sort of convert to to uh to to market rate right so it may might run out on the contract or the agreement or any of those things and then it either gets demolished and built for something else or they start renting it at uh, at a higher cost and then people have to leave they get evicted or they get displaced a uh, huge challenge that we that we uh that we deal with so let's talk a little bit about environmental issues um, again, these are all related, right? So we talked a little bit about like how we're building out instead of up because of all of those limitations. Um, and, and we do have those policies that are helping to create more housing and stuff, but this is still something that we're not doing enough about. Um, I don't know why I said that like that, about, anyway. Um, <laughs> but uh, suburban sprawl is an issue. Um, suburban sprawl refers to the spread of low density car dependent development that extends outward from urban centers, um, typically characterized by single family homes, strip malls, and large parking lots. Oh my gosh, we were just talking about some of that stuff. Um, so the pattern of growth leads to increased land consumption, deforestation, and greater re uh, reliance on cars, which in turn contributes to higher greenhouse gas emissions air pollution, and loss of natural habitats, ultimately harming the environment. Um, and you'll see here that the uh, typical carbon emission by transport type, what's number one? What's the largest? Gas cars. Now, I am not saying that everyone should have an electric car. Um, it is sort of necessary from this sort of, uh, you know, like uh, from this perspective, like looking at this graph. However, it they have their own issues too, right? Electric cars, so not the not the the uh, the sort of uh, I don't know what do you call it, like the the golden key or or whatever, um, the holy grail. If that's electric cars aren't necessarily that, but they help because look at how much there is for a uh, car gas, those carbon emissions, which is affecting our climate, right? And so again, with this issue of uh, the impact of housing on the environment the restrictive zoning that we've been talking about, uh, not being able to build multifamily homes in these certain areas that were previously usually green and blue lined um, are now zoned for only single family homes. They do not allow you to build multifamily homes in these areas. And so that is an issue. And because of that, and again, because we're building out instead of up, um, then people use their car more. So that's more greenhouse gas emission. And equitable housing access. So what does this look like? Well, tenants' rights. This is another thing, right? So we are all about making sure that more housing gets built to satisfy the needs of our community and um, of the sort of regional area of Los Angeles. Um, and one of those things means that, you know, we're make, taking care of the people that are currently in homes as well. Right. So that means like uh, tenants, uh, legal protections. Uh, we want to enforce these sort of things. Rights to a habitable home, protection from unlawful evictions, fair housing rights, etc. We need all of that stuff. And it's what's more is that we need to find ways to make sure that everyone is aware of those things. Right. I know my rights. That's important. Um, and then also we need to preserve. Uh, and maintain the existing housing stock that we have, right? If it falls into too much disrepair, then it just ends up getting demolished and replaced. Um, we also want to focus on mixed income housing um, that uh, provides great social in integration and deconcentrates poverty, 
right? So it's like there should be affordable units mixed in in these sort of like a wealthier, high resourced areas. Um, it does great for resource access. It, it, it diversifies the economy. And we also have to prevent, uh, and I'm speeding up a little bit because I'm looking at the clock and I'm seeing that I didn't time this right. I talked too much. Uh, but we... <laughs> Uh, but we uh, we want to prevent displacement, so we are uh, we want inclusionary zoning, um, which includes policies that require new developments to include a certain percentage of affordable units that can help prevent displacement by ensuring that you know like people of low and moderate income uh, have have new housing opportunities, right? Um, and, and basically, we want all of this. We need all of this for equitable development. So when we're talking about Build more housing. We want to build more housing everywhere. We're we are asking for that with this in mind. Um, one example, uh, one of those that we didn't quite get to talk too much about is community land trusts. They are an option uh, for preventing displacement. So they're usually nonprofit organizations that own land and lease it to residents. Uh, so residents can provide like a, or so they can have a permanent affordability and stability. Um, which also prevents displacement and, and, and you know, uh, uh, as property values increase. And so this this is a picture of the uh, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. It's a resident-led organization in Boston that revitalized uh, the Roxbury North Dorchester area. And they did that through community control of land and, and, uh, and a holistic approach to affordable housing, economic development, um, and environmental justice. And so that that's a huge thing there. Community land trusts is another thing that I think that we'd like to see more of. So let's get through um, solutions and our AHLA policy agenda. So we want to legalize more homes. We want to aim to end zoning restriction. So again, there are areas that are zoned for only single family homes. Um, and we want to change that, particularly in uh, wealthy, high-resource neighborhoods. Um, and so we want to create more equitable and affordable housing options. For example, the work we're doing on the CHIP, or Citywide Housing uh, Incentive Program, uh, which is great because it does allow for uh, a lot of the sort of taking back of some of the uses of land that we talked about, that all of those limitations cut down on. Well, it's great, right? CHIP is fantastic. However, it cannot be used on most of the land in Los Angeles due to the single family home zoning areas. So that's like something like 70 or 72% of the land in Los Angeles. CHIP would be great for building more housing, but it's, it's, it's like down to only about 30% of the land. That's an issue. So that's something we're doing to try to get to legalize more homes. We also wanna make homes easier to build. Development is difficult. It's expensive. It's discouraged and blocked by what we refer to as NIMBYs, right? Um, so we aim to make most developments by right. That means allowing them to sort of like pass through or uh, uh, go around, I should say, go around this to sort of discretionary process that our governments put housing projects through, right? So instead of just like getting debated by committee after committee and sometimes eventually just saying like, no, you can't build this. Um, we would like to make develop most developments as many as we can just buy right, basically skip to the front of the line. Here's your Disney fast pass. Right. Um, and we want to empower governments to approve housing. For example, uh, there are a couple things that allow for streamlining SP 35 from 2017. Um, that's a state law that streamlines approving for housing developments in cities that are not meeting their housing goals under the RENA, the Regional Housing Needs Allocation that we mentioned earlier. Um, and then there's also ADU legislation. Uh, you might refer to those as like granny flats. It's that sort of like back house. It's usually a detached thing, although it can be attached to the main house as well. Um, but there's been a lot of legislation around ADUs that makes them easier to build, and you can even sell them that, right? You can sell them as their own piece of property. Um, so great way to uh, provide another type of housing for folks, an affordable type of housing, um, and, and to use up the space that, that we have for it. We also want to fund affordable housing and end homelessness. Um, uh, something that helps with that are inclusionary 
zoning policies that we mentioned before. So um, uh, there are some places that require developers to include affordable units or pay uh, into a housing fund, which then supports building affordable units. Um, and uh, lastly, there is to strengthen renters' rights. Uh, we need to ensure that renters, as we mentioned before, have better protections from rising housing costs, unjust evictions, and poor living conditions. Um, this means expanding rent control policies, uh, enforcing anti-harassment laws, providing legal assistance to tenants facing eviction, and more. Um, that right to counsel one is really important um, because a lot of time, if you're facing eviction, um, often it's really just a matter of like who's going to show up with what kind of support. And often a landlord will have better access to legal support or legal services than a tenant does, particularly someone who is low income. And so without that sort of like free service, you might be missing out on, you know, like claiming your rights as a tenant um, and you might actually lose the case, right? So something like uh, making sure that there is a right to counsel program where people can uh, get free legal services in such a situation is really, really important. So, woo, okay, we have reached the end. Wow. Woo, okay, we're breathing now. All right, here we go. <laughs> so um, if you want to learn more, um, there is a Housing 101 quarterly. We do this quarterly. Our next one will be in January. Um, look out uh, for that. Uh, and I, it is a little different every time. Um, I am working on constantly improving, uh, uh, making these, these presentations very efficient. Um, always have work to do on that. Um, so attend another Housing 101 if you need a little refresher, maybe you want to learn a little something new, you know, um, we will have another one in January. Um, there is also, starting in January, a, our pre, bleh, pre, excuse me, pro housing leadership certification course. Uh, we've done that for two years already. It is a great course. We've had something around like 80 or 85 people go through it in total over the previous two years. Um, really gives you a, 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 goes deeper into a lot of what I've mentioned here, right? So uh, it's going to be an eight-week course. It's going to be virtual. Um, we're going to give you more information about that as the date gets closer. Uh, but there will be lots of waivers. There will be discounts, uh, things like that. So look out for that. Um, also, follow us. We're on the social medias. We're cool. We're cool. We're cool people. You know, we're on Instagram. We're on threads. We're on Twitter slash X. We're on Facebook. We're on TikTok. We're on all that stuff. And you can also join a chapter. We have, what are we up to? 17, 20, I'm not sure. Somewhere around 20 chapters, uh, local chapters throughout Los Angeles. Um, they're all over the place and there are more being spawned as we go and add to our ranks of pro housing advocates. Uh, but join a chapter. You get to uh, talk to the people that are nearest you um, in your communities, uh, talk about housing, what your communities need. Um, and we also do awesome stuff like happy hours. Uh, we do an organization one every month, and then often our chapters will have their own meetups and things like that. So join a chapter. It's a good time. It's a good time. Um, and if you'd like to receive our emails and you don't already, AbundantHousingLA.org slash sign up is where you can do that. And why don't you join us this coming Tuesday? Um, we are going to be, is that right? What are the date right? Yeah, the 17th. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, as I just talked about, we often have happy hours every month. Uh, we have our housing happy hour in downtown LA on Tuesday evening. It's at Angel City Brewery. Um, so I'm more there for a couple of hours. Just hang it out. Um, if you don't drink, that's okay. They have free sparkling water, unlimited, that you can just get from a little tap. It's cute. Um, and so, yeah, nice little place. That's sort of our home base for happy hours. Maybe we'll see you there. And my name is Joshua M. Gonzalez. I am Abundant Housing LA's education director. Uh, you can reach me at joshua at abundanthousingla.org. You can also find me on Twitter. I do not tweet. Um, but, I mean, if you ever want to catch one of my rare, random, occasional <laughs> tweets that might be amazing, go ahead and give me a follow. Um, but yeah, do we have questions? We're just over about four minutes. Um, so thank you so much for hanging in there with me. But if we have questions, let's take them. Let's do it. Ask. You can put your hand up. Uh, 
Okay, so someone actually asked earlier, and I'm not sure if you're still here, Yolanda. She wanted to know if uh, you receive a certificate. So we don't do a certificate uh, for this, specifically for the Housing 101. Uh, but uh, as I was uh, talking about, we do have that pro housing course that is starting in January, and that does come with a certificate when you've completed it. Um, so if you're looking for like, I want something official that says I am a housing advocate, which I love. Uh, we will uh, we can talk about that more as as those sort of things develop. But again, there will be lots of discounts and things like that. So have no fear if you feel like I can't pay for that. I don't have the money for that. Man, who you telling? Me either. Um, <laughs> OK, um, so uh, any other questions? I'm going to stop sharing now. OK. All right. Any questions? Juanita said, do you talk about the displacement of people in 2008? Uh, where exactly are you, refer are you referring to? In, like in Los Angeles? You want to say a little bit more about that? I don't know everything, you know. <laughs> we had a um, um, realtors and uh Corporate people and individuals were buying up property in Los Angeles, um, basically displacing people, particularly in um, South Los Angeles. And uh, rich people were coming and buying everybody from everywhere to, to just come and buy property. That means outside of our city, that means outside of our country and everything. So um, many people lost homes that, that they owned. Uh, based on they had taken out a loan for whatever reason or whatever, but it was a big issue. And so I, I don't know how long you've been doing this, but 2008, um, um, uh, Kama, um, our vice president, she was a part of that. Yeah. Uh, as far as getting money back from the banks, the, the government paid the banks and didn't pay the people who they took the houses from. So she got uh, some monies out of it. But it displaced people, and many of those people are still homeless. Mm. They are having problems and things of that nature because it was also an employment uh, uh, down downturn at that time. Employment, people lost their jobs and stuff because of setbacks and things of that nature. Right. So uh, you don't know about that. <laughs> Not specifically. Um, yeah, like I've I've really only been in. And I don't have a huge housing background. I actually come from. Uh, like therapy and like mental health space um and so it's just been in the past couple of years so there's some of the finer like uh timeline points that i'm not like as clear about but that sounds like something i, I definitely need to read up on a little bit um mm -hmm. so thank you for sharing that with us because that is that is really really important okay so research it research the courts federal courts um Whatever. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. That was our county office and uh, files and things of that nature. And okay. if, you, if you need help, contact me. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Max asked, are the slides available to look at again? Yes. Um, so if you registered for this, uh, I think we did it through Eventbrite, um, uh, then I will go ahead and email everyone who RSVP'd um, a the slide deck so that, that way you can look at those again i will also include links to like our housing term glossary that i mentioned um, and i will also include any other useful links that i may have mentioned or we want you to have um, and i will also be sending when i upload this because we do record it and we upload it to youtube so if you'd like to review any of that stuff or show your friends um, uh, then it will be available to you so thank you max thank you for asking that does anyone else have any questions? I, I kept you out a little bit longer uh, than I intended to. So thank you so much for sticking it out with me. <laughs> Thanks a lot. This is awesome. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Okay. Have a fantastic evening, y'all. Um, this will not be the last you, you hear or see of me. I hope to see you all at other things and um, and look for my email. I will send out early early next week. Thank you, Juanita. Thank you so much for being here. And Thank for, you so for much. Up what you did. Thank you, Graciela. Thank you, Sheree. I see you, Sheree.
Thank you, Max. Courtney was here left already. Thank you, Courtney. Bye, everybody. Have a good, good night. Good night, everyone. Great stuff, Josh. Thank you. Bye.